Welcome to our e-cancer session here from the Genital Urinary Symposium Masco in San Francisco. We have agreed upon we start from the left to the right. Sophie Gillison from St. Gallen, Switzerland, Heather Payne from London, UK, and Eric Small from San Francisco. He's a local hero. My name is Kurt Miller. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a urologist uh, from Berlin, Germany. And just to, to start with that, Eric, you're not only the local hero, you're also today's hero because you're closest to the data we're going to discuss uh, on non metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. You, you had the privilege to, to present the Spartan data today. Can you give us just a, a very short introduction on that and then we're going to discuss PROSPER and see what that means for our sure. daily practice? Sure. So, as you know, the, the background for this study and, and the clinical imperative is that patients uh, with non-metastatic prostate cancer, frankly, whether it's hormone sensitive or not, but in castration resistant <coughs> prostate cancer, that we know that many of those patients will develop metastases. And work from Matt Smith has previously shown us from, from a denosumab study um, who those patients are. So we, we can predict pretty well who's going to develop metastases or die from prostate cancer. And it's defined, as you know, by patients with a very short PSA doubling time. So we selected those patients, and, and the principal goal of the study was to delay metastases. Uh, the, the metric that is used is metastasis free survival. Um, and uh, the study is very straightforward. Patients who had non metastatic uh, castration resistant prostate cancer, PSA doubling time of 10 months or less, um, were, had negative conventional imaging. Uh, for some of our colleagues in Germany, that may be a <laughs> strange concept. To we not come to that. <laughs> we come to that later <laughs> to, on. To, to not use <laughs> PSMA PET, but um, by conventional imaging. Uh, negative bone scan, negative CAT scans of chest, abdomen, and pelvis, uh, those patients were randomly assigned to receive either apalutamide or placebo. And the primary endpoint of the study was metastasis-free survival. Can we prevent or delay the time to metastasis? Um, this study, as the PROSPER study, was profoundly positive. Uh, it met its endpoint easily. Uh, the hazard ratio is quite high. Uh, there's a two-year uh, prolongation in time to metastases um, if you take apalutamide. So in terms of the primary endpoint, I'm sure we can talk about some of the secondary endpoints as well, um, this study really uh, was able to establish for the first time, because we don't have any standard of care in these patients, that we can delay the time to metastases or death. So, okay. I, I was surprised by the magnitude of the advantage, to be honest. How about you? Did you did you expect it to be so positive in, in, in the primary endpoint? I mean, we had a couple of negative studies with mm -hmm. uh, the nosomap, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things going on. So it was it took me by surprise. How about you? Yeah, I have, I have to admit, so the denosumab study was, was actually positive, but it was, yeah, I mean, it was, barely, it was just barely, barely positive. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, that magnitude of effect was, was really surprising to me as well, um, except that obviously um, these drugs are very, very effective in the metastatic setting. So, it, and, and denosumab is not um, for progression free survival. So, so I think it was to, to believe, or I mean, we all believed, I, I guess, that it could be very positive, but that positive was really impressive, I have to, to say, yes. By and large, when you look at, at side effects, not much new signals here, mm -hmm. also not from abalutamide as I see it. The, the only thing that, that was a little bit surprising, Heather, we discussed it before, was that in, in the PROSPER trial, the, the patients in the ancelotamide arm, once they were off study, there was a 15% mm -hmm. death rate which is kind of uh, hard to explain, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, is, is there any uh, interpretation here? Do, is that any meaningful, or what does that mean? Um, I think it was incredibly <laughs> <laughs> surprising, especially yeah. because we didn't see that signal in the aflutamide, in the, in the Spartan study. Um, I, don't, I think it's something that's obviously going to be discussed as time goes on, and I think we need to be a bit closer to the data to know the reason for that. Um, the reasons given during the session were that the men were on enzalutamide for considerably longer um, in, that, in, in that group, and there was a slight increased risk of hypertension and cardiovascular 
toxicities, but it wasn't huge. Right. I mean, and so I, I don't really know. I don't think there are any explanations for that at the moment, but I'm sure it's something that may become more apparent with more time and um, investigation of the data. I, I can tell you that for the Spartan study, the percentage, I was just looking it up, the percentage of patients uh, in the apalutamide arm that died without evidence of metastasis, so for some other cause, was 1.1 percent, mm -hmm. which was quite yeah. low. And in the placebo arm, it was 0 0.7 percent, so pretty similar. Um, so I, I also didn't mm -hmm. understand that data, and I, I'm sure we'll be getting more information over time. Eric, mm -hmm. you, you talked about the other endpoints, and, and, and film, you know, questions the endpoints a little bit in terms <laughs> of what is really what is the real benefit for the patient. Right. So, um, and, and if you look at the trend, I mean, also overall survival shows some separation of the curve. Um, is there any, is there, I'm sure there is a plan to have further evaluation of the data, seeing if overall survival gets significantly positive. Yeah, so the thing to remember for, again, for Spartan, is that there only 24% of events have happened with regards to survival. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very unstable and immature data. Nevertheless, uh, there's a hazard ratio of you know, 0 0.7 and p-value is 0 0.07 in survival. So we were, I was actually mm -hmm. very pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. when I saw that um, because it's, it's certainly trending in the right direction. We'll have to see, I mean, it's just way early. One of the unique things I think about Spartan that we were able to do was uh, by providing second line therapy to patients once they develop metastases, yeah. label, by the way, on the label, wasn't mm -hmm. off label use of abiraterone, um, the majority of patients have already gotten second line therapy. So I don't think that we're going to be seeing sort of this late effect of survival going away because suddenly all the control patients mm -hmm. get treated. I, I need to address your what what is called your uh, PFS two, yeah. yeah, which which is counterintuitive to me because if I recall your tables correctly, even in the apalutamide arm, uh, uh, the treatment number one was abiraterone in second line. Is that true? That's the most common yeah. treatment. Yeah. So I would expect abiraterone is not as effective following apalutamide yeah. than following ADT. Mm -hmm. And the contrary is true because PFS2 was longer in the apalutamide yes. arm than in the ADT yeah. arm. How does that? I mean, is, is there <laughs> any explanation for yeah, that? It's, it was certainly one of the most intriguing pieces of information. So mm -hmm. PFS2 was measured, uh, was the time from uh, randomization through the primary event, through metastasis, through the secondary therapy, through progression through the secondary therapy. And uh, that was measured as PFS2. So it takes, it, it, you're absolutely right that it takes into account uh, time following the primary endpoint. It's obviously proximate to survival. And there was the curve separate, and it's statistically significant. The hazard ratio is 50% in, in, in favor of apalutamide. And so the, the statement that I made was, I'm not getting at the mechanism yet. <laughs> the, statement, the statement that I made was, it's fascinating that treatment used in the non-metastatic CRPC setting has an impact on therapy that is administered per label in the metastatic setting as measured by PFS2. Now, it's not PSA response proportion. I don't, I, we don't have that data, and we're going to find, we're going to, we, need, yeah, we obviously are right. very interested in looking at it. But there, but what it does point out is that these drugs are not mutually exclusive. Right, that you still gain benefit by the late addition of abiraterone. Um, it's very perplexing. <laughs> which, is, which is totally counterintuitive yep. because, yeah. you know, abiraterone following enzalutamide has like a 8% PSA response rate. And, and so that, that would be, it's quite surprising. It's, it's, yeah. And we're getting two really good endpoints for yeah. one study, yeah. aren't we? That's this, right. That's the, right. The whole sort of yeah. sequencing. But you're absolutely right. We need to look at the, yeah. at the PSA response proportion because yeah. we don't know what it is. And all mm. we're really looking at is at the aggregate uh, time. Mm. So mm. it may be that the benefit that you get up front um, 
it more than it outweighs any downside at the back end. Yeah, and I, I sat close to Matthew Smith and I <laughs> asked him the same question okay. because I think I thought the same like you, that, that the PFS2 is just from beginning, the right. second yeah. Yeah. therapy, because in some other studies it's, that's right. how it is defined. But what it is defined is really from start of randomization, yes, yeah. so it's, like it's, it's treatment one and yeah, two. Yeah, so, so this is a bit different from um, when you just think about PFS2 from like start of the second treatment, right. but it is not um, longer than... Right, we don't have If that I plan. understood That's Matthew correct. correctly. That's correct. It's taking a, away a little bit of the second one, but it's mm. still longer, the two in addition. So okay, right. Eric, Eric mentioned PSMA pets. <laughs> and, yes. and, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, or I, I learned from your colleague, I think Dr. Feng was his name in, in Felix, yeah. Felix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we're using it any, every day. Yeah. So <laughs> he, he talked about <laughs> oligometastatic disease, actually. Right, right. That's okay. right. Are you using it in daily practice? Specifically, I mean, you know, the, the typical patient for M0 CRPC is that, you know, rising PSA, then he gets ADT for rising PSA, and at some point you do some imaging. Uh, yeah. Do you use PSMA PET in these situations? So the thing is actually, um, it, it's a bit different because the Swiss are a bit reluctant to start <laughs> ADT early. So we actually generally um, not starting in the non-metastatic setting. So we don't have that many M0 um, CRPC patients just because we don't start the ADT so, so early. But coming back to the novel, like <laughs> imaging things, What's happening now is that we, not in like the CRPC setting, but in the castration naive setting, um, we are starting to do a lot of the novel imaging. Mm. And we find a lot of like oligometastatic disease mm. that is yeah. like <coughs> treated all over the place, as we mm. all know, even if we don't have any good data for it. Mm. But so, so we don't have that many non-metastatic patients anymore because with the novel imaging, obviously you find much yeah. earlier yeah. a lot of metastasis. Just the question would be, you know, does it make a difference? Because you had conventional imaging right. and, and, you know, like some people nowadays do just PSMA PET-CT, so they make the in conventional imaging M0 patients to metastatic patients, and then we would start with one of the novel endocrine agents and anyway. Right. Right? <laughs> At least you no, probably I mean, do the same Eric, in, in, Eric has in we Germany, do it, yeah, right? We do it all the time. So, Eric has mentioned it. I mean, what, what does it mean non-metastatic? That's right. a matter of how, you, so how, how closely you look right. That's exactly and how right. many cells you find. That's exactly and right. so obviously the question will be in the future, uh, Heather, what would you do with a patient you do a PSMA pad, I know you do. Um, <laughs> and then you find like uh, uh, four to five lymph node meds, you know, spread across the body, not a typical candidate for stereotactic body radiation. So what do you do? Is it still, is it still the apalutamide candidate or is it already <laughs> the abiraterone? Or you give ENSA, which is then approved for both? Or what's, what's your strategy in that? What will be your strategy? Um, I think it will depend what's licensed really <laughs> at the time. Yeah, that's a um, uh, but, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, I think PSMA PET scanning has changed practice yeah, definitely. considerably. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly changed practice, you say, for oligometastasis mm. and for patients with rising PSA. But I think with, with all of these men in, in, in Spartan and Prosper, they all have microscopic metastatic Absolutely. disease. Yeah, and it's just exactly. finding the, the correct imaging to be able to detect that. And um, I think sort of treating earlier, delaying the burden of metastasis must be a good thing. Yeah. We actually, uh, there, is, there are a subset of our patients, I don't know the number, it's small, mm. that had PSMA PETs and also had conventional imaging. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and mm. these are some patients at our institution because we are one of the few places in the U.S. Yeah. that I know. Yeah. Yes. Um, but we also, there's German patients on our study, there's Australian patients, mm -hmm. and so, so patients did get PSMA PETs. Um, I can't imagine that the outcome is any different for them mm -hmm. if, if their conventional imaging is uh, normal, but we are going to look at that subset. Mm -hmm. um, our, our stand is exactly what we just said. I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, these, it's no surprise that these mm -hmm. men have micrometastatic disease. They mm -hmm. were selected, mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in a sense, to have micrometastatic yeah. disease, and either you can't detect them with conventional imaging or you can with a PSMA PET. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really change matters. So in terms of the efficacy of the treatment, I don't think it has an impact. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the label, that might become an issue. Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, how, how, how do you label? I mean, it's worth pointing out mm -hmm. that in, in, in the U.S., 
Abiraterone and enzalutamide are, are approved for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer defined by conventional imaging, not defined by PSMA PET. Yeah. But the label doesn't say by yeah, conventional no. imaging. No, it doesn't. No. It's, but it's, that's what the studies were, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah, it's yeah. sort of what we're stuck yeah. with, this anachronism. I mean, at, at the end, you're right. Mm. What, what I, I think all, all the, the data point in one direction, use these drugs earlier. It's, it's in the, in the hormone-sensitive setting. It's now in the M0 setting. And also, additionally, what Nick James presented in his talk, also, mm -hmm. you know, using those attack cell earlier, also in the M M0 yep. setting, I think that's w what, the, what the whole trend goes to. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? A absolutely. And mm -hmm. again, uh, the PFS2 data supports that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you would worry. I mean, the one downside of using the drugs early is that you use them and then you're out. You're done. Exactly. And the PFS2 data suggests that, that's, that we don't need to worry about mm -hmm. that. So I think the, the body of evidence, I agree with you, suggests earlier treatment, less disease on board. It should come as a surprise. I mean, this is true in every other malignancy, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're just a little slow yeah, in prostate well, yeah. cancer to realize yeah, I mean, that. I mean, Phil mentioned, Heather, Phil mentioned the, the side effects. Do, uh, are you worrying about the side effects of these drugs, like, like upper and uh, arborotron? Is that something? I mean, you give them for a long time at the yeah. end of the day. Is that something you're worried about? Not really. I mean, I think it's important to measure blood pressure. Yeah. And I think everybody measures blood pressure in abiraterone, but perhaps in enzalutamide or with aflutamide, I think it's something that should be sort of put into the follow-up regime, that we need to monitor them for hypertension because we can treat that. So can we show up in, in this year's St. Gallen's conference if it, yeah, I mean, this, this is yes, yeah, completely new in 2019, field. 2019, yeah. 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 So, so we had it in the 2015 yeah. and we decided not to put it into 2017 because there was no new data and we, we knew the data would come coming. out. So yeah. It was reading out really fast. So we definitely will have it in the 2019. Um, and discuss what people are doing. But I still think, you know, coming back to the M0, um, the stampede data for the M0 mm -hmm. with Abiratron look pretty amazing as well, it, right? It does. So, yeah. so that will be same, yeah. even earlier then. And then it comes the big question, you know, like what happens if you have given the, the Abbey in the M0 setting for, for two years, yeah. right? And, and what's happening now when they get... Um, perhaps like, um, you know, like in, in the M0 CLPC mm. setting, but they had two, two years or something of Abbey. It would be interesting to see the, the new biology. In, yeah, the mechanisms of resistance right? are, will yeah. be very compelling. I agree. Yeah. So I, agree. I think we're, we had an interesting discussion. I think, as always, we had some new answers and many new questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, yeah. I'm really yeah. looking forward for our next year's discussion here and see uh, what daily practice is like. Until then, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.